welcome to another episode of Agency Automators. Today, it's super exciting. I get to spend time with my best friend, Jordan Chu. Boom! What's up, dude? Hey, hey. And Jess, Jess Peck. It is Hello. so cool to have you here. I'm so It's excited. so cool to be here. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we uh, had a great chat before taping. We got to deal with some really fun audio technical blah blah issues, which was really fun. Uh, and Jess, we we had a little bit of insight into your robot apocalypse as your machine was yeah pushing out That's the goal. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's jump right in. I've watched your meteoric rise in the field of digital marketing over the past couple of years. Uh, just as you broke through and took Python by storm and got to speak at huge conferences, and now you're at local SEO guide. I mean, just um, really, I'm, I'm amazed by you and oh. uh, what you've accomplished in the past couple of years. And so uh, just really, really stoked to have you. Uh, for people that don't know you, can you give us just a couple minute intro to your bio, your background? Because you, you've been in a lot of cool places and done a lot of cool stuff. Uh, yeah, like... I, I obviously I paid you to say all that, um, but <laughs> thank you. Uh, I so I got an undergraduate degree in international politics, focused on human rights, uh, and then I took some statistics classes. And I was like, "Wow, I like this a lot more than I like learning about depressing things." Um, I worked like you know. Wait, can we? Can I swear on this podcast? Is that okay? Just just checking. I worked some shitty jobs after college where I was like the only person who could use a computer. So they were like, oh, can you make us a website uh, and fix our printer? So I did that for a couple of years. And then I went to Perficient, uh, which used to be Stone Temple and uh, started off doing like tech SEO and kind of morphed into helping build the tools, but also still doing tech SEO. And then I went over to CVS for like a year and worked with Adobe Analytics and really, you know, people, people really like Adobe Analytics, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm one of them. Um, and then I, during all this time, I was kind of playing with machine learning and what, like how to expand automation beyond just like running a Python script that like smashes data together and that kind of thing. Um, and I kind of, got into talking with LSG and uh, they had a spot on their internal tools team for someone who was into machine learning. And I was like, well, here's what I've made and here's what I want to make. And they were like, cool, come on down. Um, And so I've been there since. And that's been like, it's been a really fun environment. It's super interesting to see the kind of problems in SEO that you can try and solve with machine learning and which ones you shouldn't try and solve with machine learning. Um, I really enjoyed CVS to some extent, but I think I enjoy SEO more than analytic, like, like web analytics, I guess. Yeah. Um, That's super cool. So remind us how you got into Python. It had to do with images right you had to like classify images or something like that yeah um we so when I was at proficient um like I'm I'm big on image search I I think that's like a really underrated and interesting part of search yeah um and I would I mean you know I was I was a naive young child at 25 and I was like this is the future Google's going to be using machine learning on all images in the next year. I feel it. Um, I was not correct. They have, they're not doing that yet because it's extremely resource intensive, but we were talking about how much different companies use machine learning and what data sets they were using. Um, And I like built a little Python thing that pinged off Google's image recognition API and uh, a couple other libraries and like Amazon's API and IBM Watson's API to see what the results we got back were and kind of compare those results with each other so we could see like, 
oh, Google's a really good generalist. Uh, like IBM is really good at specifics. Amazon is really good at products, like that kind of info. And it was really interesting to see this comparison. Mm. Um, and we also compared it to what people thought and kind of matched those up as well. Wow. That is super, super cool. Like uh, we've been building this product uh, called Explorer and we use classification, but it's really driven by regex. And uh, we had felt like we were not going to build models and we weren't going to do machine learning as part of our tooling. And uh, we just built our first model. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, it's really neat. And uh, what it's enabling us to do is to classify uh, combinations of query and URL as site links so that we can remove site links out of our, our search data so that we can actually have cleaner CTR curves so that we can then say like, hey, position two, we'd expect this quantity of impressions or clicks and to be able to see variance between those. And we're in introductory proof of concept stage, but it's like, ooh, we can build something that actually is useful. Super yeah, that's fun. that's the fun, like, I, we, we've done, you know, used like k-means clustering and stuff on keywords to try and like because you get a lot of data right when you're yeah. doing when you're on the google search console back back end or whatever yeah. and like part we've been p trying to pass that with like k-means clustering being like yeah. well this is the kind of keyword that gets a lot of clicks and this kind of gets this many clicks um we do some ngram analysis so like these these words come up in the queries that get the most like response like that kind of thing mm -hmm. um and we like i think that's like some of the places where machine using machine learning in like this kind of data acquisition is it's best to use it when you can kind of see patterns that people can't see sure because like you got to assume like Google's a big thing of a big mishmash of algorithms. It's probably catching patterns that nobody can. So maybe a couple of your own algorithms can kind of see those same patterns and like point them out to a human being who might not be able to read it from a distance. Right. Um, and also it saves a lot of time. I don't know about you guys, but like, uh, class of like we do some keyword classification stuff and we've done it manually and we've done it through like different algorithms and we like we like saving our analysts time so they can think about stuff that is like important um and so that's that's where we found a lot of utility so you mentioned something interesting where there are times to use machine learning and there's times to not use machine learning and like something like regex, which you mentioned yeah. pre-show. So what's your thought process for deciding which route to take? Um, like it's usually a discussion, uh, like so someone will come and be like, can we solve this problem? Like someone from the agency side will be like, I have a bunch of data. I don't want to pass it by hand because I have like 3 million rows. Can we use machine learning on it to get this result? And then it's like, what does like using machine on it, machine learning on it look like? And what is the data? Like are the patterns so kind of simple that we can figure out ways to classify them without that? And are they, or are they like more complicated and more weird and more like woven together, if that makes sense? Like mm -hmm. an example might be, you know, do we want to classify local intent through machine learning? Or do we just go, if it has like a location ID, if someone's like, in Farmville, 
Massachusetts. That's not a real place. That's a video game. Um, <laughs> but like in this place X, that's definitely local intent. So do we just want to classify anything with like a location name or near me as local intent? Or do we try and build an algorithm around it? And with the effort of that and then like the results from that be worth it because a lot of the time you can build a model and then it's kind of soft and wiggly if that it's a weird way to describe it but the results are just more porous so sometimes you have to have a manual like go through the results anyway and be like oh you know i see like <laughs> uh the machine couldn't tell the difference between like two words that are kind of similar but have really different meanings or just kind of grouped those together or like I don't know if a client's a client if the client's name is like something from a different industry and those get kind of tangled together like you that's um, really interesting how so having done most of cla my classification with regex, the question that I usually get asked first when I, ex when I tell people that is, how do you handle misspellings? <laughs> I'm like, well, uh, why'd you have to ask that? And so how do you think about sort of cleaning the data and how important is it? And not how important, but can you, can you opine on that whole concept of, you know, how do you deal with misspellings and regex and how do you think about that? I, I'm, t I'm tenting my fingers like Mr. Burns. Like the first thing I did when I got to LSG was I built a library for us to use to clean data sets because I think it is the most important part of any like machine learning process and any like larger data process. And like also understanding what the results of cleaning that data will be on your data. Like all of those things are just like hella important, right? Like uh, I think- Let's go deep here. No <laughs> one has ever gone deep on our show into this. So this is really key. I think it's really cool. I mean, yeah. So it's like, I'm, I'm excited. I love talking about cleaning data. Um, I think like, it's all layers and layers and layers, right? So we have, I have like 20 something functions that can be pulled in at any given time because there are going to be times where you don't want to clean certain things. But if we just ran the whole thing, it, um, it has like a spell check that just shifts, like it just makes things spelled correctly, um, which again, you're probably not going to want to use necessarily every time because sometimes people might misspell something um, and it's supposed to be misspelled or whatever. Um, but it does have a way you can kind of, <laughs> you can say, oh, this is a brand name, so don't spell check this. This is like, here are the words that we expect to be misspelled. Ignore those, fix everything else. Yeah. You're going to want to like lower case everything just because that's going to make it cleaner and easier to manipulate. You're going to, there is a function that removes any non alphanumeric characters. So, like dashes, periods, slashes, just all of that, like ripped out of there. Um, Emojis too? Do you, do you get rid yeah, of them? We, yeah, we get rid of them emojiless. We're, we're ab absent of joy. Um, <laughs> I hate that shit. We are miserable bastards. That's not true. <laughs> um, like, uh, we strip, like, uh, if, if someone is, we've had cases where, like, students have obviously copy pasted the like paragraph yes. long questions. Yes. How do you like doing engrams on 500 yeah. word search terms? We, I've we had just that too. cut it off after 180 characters, baby. We're just like, <laughs> nah, <laughs> um, we can like, uh, and again, like all of this is like optional, right? So yeah. like we're pairing all of this down, but we know there are going to be cases where we don't want to go hardcore, like get rid of everything. There are going to be cases where we're like, you know, maybe we need all of these dashes because they're part of the brand name, or maybe we need X, Y, Z. Um, 
like if we're doing an international engagement, we don't want to get rid of all non like Roman characters, right? If one of their big sites is in like Jordan, you're gonna want Arabic responses as part of like the search corpus. Um, and <laughs> my favorite tool, my favorite part of the tool set because it was a real weird thing to build is we have a. Uh, we have a function, our internal search tool is called Jarvis, our internal like tool is called Jarvis. And there's a function called puritanical Jarvis, which just gets rid of curse words, porn queries, drug stuff, just anything that's like not safe for work. Um, and <laughs> I love know, that. It, it really helped out with some of like some of our clients just had a back like data set that was just full of like porn queries and we were like well we don't want to we don't want to like focus on those for rank tracking and that kind of thing we're just gonna clean those out of the corpus and ignore them um and it didn't mean like i was going backwards and forwards with one of our uh seos like coming up with stuff that was not in the like data set to match that up so like we were just sending swear words backwards and forwards as part of our work day. And I was like, oh, I really hope this doesn't get taken out of context. And like, oh, <laughs> yeah. HR is like, hey, why did you message like a bunch of really weird search terms backwards and forwards? I'm like, I swear to God, it's just because we were trying to get rid of them. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. And like, yeah. Uh, and then we just have a function that like you can input anything and it'll clear it out so like you can input your own words so if you've got a client who ranks for a bunch of stuff but they want to focus on one thing and you so you want the data set to focus on that one thing you can just clear out the other stuff by being like get rid of these things um and yeah there are some other minor functions um but again a lot of it is just <laughs> scrub 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 so we can like have an idea of like the remainder and like do some engram analysis do some clustering all that kind of good stuff on like actually good data rather than garbage clustering is is something that i've been thinking a lot about and haven't totally solved but this is like the big problem that i'm trying to solve this year uh intellectually anyway this is like where my mind has been at all year what and you and i've done dms back and forth when i was trying to learn how to approach it how are you thinking about clustering these days are, are you stoked on one particular approach or are you finding that there's different tools that you need depending on the the kind of corpus of data you're working with like any thoughts on that um i'm i'm big on just kind of like setting up like ngrams and kind of letting letting it sort itself out um like uh we had a way of clustering that involved like manual classification and then using that to train like and classify the rest of the text but that was very very like heavy computing heavy manual labor didn't really save anyone any time which was the point of having like clustering in the first place yeah and a lot of it could just be we could just use regex and like get very similar results um again like i think part of my job is being like we don't need ml for this i think that's part of responsibly using ml and clustering and data science is being like oh we don't need to go that far we can do this with a lot more simple tool but I do think you get to see, again it's like seeing these patterns that are like I see the like this is what a machine would see this is the kind of pattern a machine would understand um. okay that's that's pretty interesting so when you're talking about heavy manual labor are we talking about classifying a thousand rows, ten thousand rows, fifty thousand rows. Like how how much data are we talking about? I mean, like 
it, I think. Cause the, I know the answer about our site links and for us, it was 20 something thousand rows of data. Yeah. Um, we would have like, I mean, it would depend on the client, right. And like yeah. the data set we were using it, the most boring SEO answer of it depends strikes again. Uh, yeah. but you know, I think we would have times where we were like, oh, we only need to classify like a hundred rows to train this. It's not very many. Oh, wow. Wow. We, and then we'd have a classifier um, who really, I feel bad because this took a, it was kind of a really boring activity, but they would go in and classify all these terms and then they'd uh, send, we'd, send it off classify it and it would come back and it would be garbage data so we'd have to do it again um and that was the like part of the problem of the like training was how many how much is our input going to be and how much time do we want to spend on the input and part of it was if we don't spend enough time on the input the output's going to be garbage and if the output yeah. is garbage we have to do it again and it'll take longer and longer and we still have to, you know, run the model, take up all this computing power and get bad results. Um, and like in the end, we just kind of uh, outside of like particular circumstances where we really need very accurate data for a data set that isn't tameable. We would like there's like the cost benefit is kind of meh, <laughs> mid as the kids say so jess question here do the the amount of time and resources that it took clearly it 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 was easier just doing it via regex from what it sounds like yeah um because it was across like multiple industries so you kind of had to build that model again and again is is that right yes okay yeah so, sorry go ahead go ahead no i was just gonna say like yeah, and like, I think if you are in house and you are dealing with one big sure. like data set that changes, I think you should bu try building your own models and like using right. it because I think you're gonna get like it's one of the cases where you don't have to constantly rebuild and re like put together your information, mm -hmm. and I think that is really like it's a really good way of kind of classifying stuff and seeing information if you are in-house and you can use the same kind of terms week over week and use the same classification week over week you you read my mind because that's where i was going <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> I'll, I'll turn the esp off wait can that. we rewind can you wait that last sentence and a half i started drifting <laughs> I had questions, but I missed something important. Can you say the last sentence and a half again? Oh God, the bit about or ESP. Or three quarters. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think if you are in house, like building your own. Yep, I got, uh, I got all that. Yeah. I just missed the very end. I, I lost uh, you. I'm so sorry. You have your no. You have. It's just. Uh, yeah, it's no worries. Um, you, you can use your own the same kind of classification week over week and see yeah. like it gives you a better look over time because you have your own information, your own build, um, and you know the, so um, the things. So the model feels accurate over time. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. And out of curiosity, kind of get in the weeds there. Are you building the models out within BigQuery or are you kind of making your own uh, duct tape together, multiple analysis? Uh, it is. We have a pipeline uh, and the pipeline involves uh, some Slack API stuff. We have AWS in there. We have BigQuery. We have, uh, and we have uh, Google Sheets. So it, the model used to be, we, we send our uh, wonderful classifier off into Google Sheets and they go through and they classify a bunch of terms. And then that information, <laughs> goes off into a uh, like big query that where it gets pulled in to the model which then gets run on the data which then spits out results and then we all go 
oh, this is garbage. Oh no, we have to do it again. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, and I I, I do want to say we still, we use like, and like clustering algorithms that don't need training that like just pick up patterns on their own. Like um, we use n-grams and that kind of stuff. Um, So we we haven't abandoned this effort entirely. It's just, we've abandoned the one where someone has to spend like six hours a week writing down like query names so i feel like a i feel dumb asking this question but like we do a form of n-gram analysis in our tool but that's just tokenizing words and counting how often they appear and like how does that i feel dumb asking like how is that clustering like how is that you can pull out those n-grams and like yeah. use them to like pull them into like k-means and cluster them around the n-gram basically um okay uh, it it's it's got fine results yeah so uh okay but it's not oh. like the superstar of clustering got it, got it. okay i I clearly am learning as I go, right? It's like, uh, that's really neat. Okay, so um, what are you enjoying doing with regex? What, Cause you talked about there are times that you think regex is great. And regex is probably the easiest thing for people to learn if they're trying to build a classifier. It's like all kinds of just if then logic, you know, building a big old case statement potentially. Yeah, I mean, I I think like if you are trying to pull specific data, it's like using regex is a really easy way to do it, and a really easy way to just be like, if it has this or this or this, it can be that. Like like you said, it's a case statement. You can use it as a case statement, right? And I think if you're pulling your own data into like a uh, big query or whatever, like you can kind of do like baby's first classification on you know, just by like using regex and using a case statement and being like, here are the kinds of queries that I think of this, I would like them to be labeled like this. And then you will have like a data set of like, I think this is all location data and this is all like, these people are all looking for tutorials about how to do X and these people are all looking to buy and these people like um, just through the way you can kind of pass data with regex. Um, and I think like, you know, it has its pros and cons. The pros are it will be very accurate and precise um, and, you know, the cons are like maybe you don't want to do it yourself and you can just go use like SEM Rush has some classification stuff. Mm. And the other con is y- you have to figure out what the regex looks like. And um, if you're anything like me, that involves like three different mistakes before like oh, yeah. actually getting it. Yeah. You're going to regex one and like testing the regex and being like, what, what did I do here? Like, I don't, why isn't this working? until it like works and you're like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, Do you, um, can you go into a little bit about this concept you brought up earlier of toolification and when an organization should, or an agency should build tools or when they shouldn't, like, how do you think through that? Um, my, my rule of thumb is if it takes a long time and it's boring and uh, repetitive, it is a perfect candidate for toolification. Um, like, I don't, I don't see any reason why like an SEO should be like spending all of their time like going through row by row of a spreadsheet, right? Or like that's a very classic example. Is like doing the same thing to every row of a spreadsheet or whatever. Um, Like (laughs) if you are 
an agency of three people and none of you can code, maybe don't try toolification. You can probably <laughs> get away with get away with like just kind of hanging out with the tools you already have. But I think larger agencies should really like. I mean, I'm biased, right? I've worked in the tools and dev DevOps teams at the agencies I've worked at. I really like doing that. I think we brought, brought a lot of like benefits. Um, and I feel like you guys maybe you know, named the podcast is Agency Automators. So you're obviously also yeah. biased. So uh, wait, because we're both biased, I'll just say everyone should have a tools DevOps team and it always brings great greatness. So do that. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I think it's just like, if there are things you are spending all your time on that are repetitive or like. It's totally how we think about automation yeah. too, Jess. I mean, we've talked about that over and over and over again. If it's, if it's, if it's boring, you hate it, it's not your sweet spot, and it's automatable where you can look at an entire process, break it into its component parts, can you automate each micro step along the way, and if you can chain them all together, and it makes sense, and you think you can build something that's robust, yes, automate it. If not, then don't. And we, we always try and kind of keep fingerprints, like human fingerprints, on each of the steps right like machines shouldn't do the thinking they should be supporting the thinking of people like we've we've got the people in our agency because we think they're real smarties um so and we don't think they can be automated away yet right yet no not <laughs> ever probably <laughs> I, i'm saying a lot of like real data um but uh like everyone like all of the analysts and SEOs, we're here to support them and the way they think and their time, right? And like, if we're not doing that, then we're not automating for a reason. Um, and we we like to, you know, we want people in the process just because people are better at noticing when something has gone wrong or like something doesn't make any sense than, pe than bots are. Because if the results are off in a way that makes sense to the machine and you don't have eyes on that data, you could be sitting with that data for a really long time before anyone notices and making decisions based on that. And you don't want to end up in the situation where like you, I don't know, accidentally cut off all of the top ranking keywords from your client's search console data because someone left a limit somewhere in a SQL query and no one noticed. Oh, no. Like you don't want to be in that limit situation. Ten. Yeah. They don't seem to rank for a lot of keywords. <laughs> yeah. Seems it's always Wikipedia ten. doesn't rank for anything. It's so weird. <laughs> So Jess, I want to throw you a little bit of a curveball, and I don't think we've ever asked this on the show. Okay. But how do you, it's it's easy, I promise. Easy. Okay. Um, how do you think about like technical debt and maintenance with your automations and your models? Um, this is a that's that's a really good question. Um I I think one of the things that is interesting to me is like as these tech like you know, it's like tech ops and DevOps teams will grow and then they'll realize tech debt exists and kind of go back and be like, oh, we have to rewrite everything. Um, I will say the team I'm on is like really good at that. Um, my boss, Brian Heckler, is very thoughtful about, we do a lot with reusability um, and looking like, using object-oriented programming when it's like necessary but kind of also not using it when it doesn't make sense um everything is like very modular um we you we document a lot um we kind of show our code to each other to make sure it makes sense within the group uh we do like code reviews um and uh, yeah <laughs> Ooh, that's uh, super cool. Yeah. Uh, it's just a lot of like 
collaboration, communication, and then um, creating modular reuse reusable parts that can interact with each other without like uh needing to be a certain way so like if i have a function that does something to data it shouldn't matter what form the data is in it should just be able to take it and do the thing and spit something out you can deal with the data elsewhere the point is like this function just does this um and that really helps kind of us maintain the code. Um, and we, we comment a lot. Like, I don't know. I, I went through, a, I went through a phase when I was learning development where like all of the cool kids seem to be like, your code should just be explainable and you shouldn't need to comment anywhere. No. So I went, I, I went through a phase where I didn't comment anything and like, I couldn't understand what I was doing. Like I went back and I was like, what was this? What was this even trying to do? Yeah. Um, we we comment like hardcore because like I don't know uh, when I was at Proficient uh, we had the <laughs> kind of horrible if one of us got stepped outside and got hit by a bus would the entire organization collapse and we that was like how we were thinking about it was like if one of us like were like I don't know one of our engineers really loved hiking and we were like if he goes and like goes hiking for six months along the Appalachian Trail we need to keep this machine chugging along without him so how are we gonna do that wow very interesting so are you taking like a test driven development first approach then or kind of hodgepodgey kind of hodgepodgey um we've been working but getting like... less so I yes. mean I've talked to Brian a lot and they were he used to do uh they were like uh very like hey we have a problem let's solve it let's start coding without yeah. planning and then they hired a guy who had a computer science degree and it like changed everything internally right yeah um and i would say like we have a computer science guy we have like a boot camp guy and we also have um Tessa Vox, I realize I've never pronounced her last name. Sorry, Tessa, if you can hear this, but she's a project, a project manager and like having a project manager, fuck it, it fully changes the game. Like, oh, wow. like I, uh, I don't know, I can't recommend that enough because she keeps everyone on task. She's really good at like being like, Here are the, here's what we need, here are the parameters how are you doing like what is your status on this what like i don't know it's like having that check-in and having that communication again is freaking awesome um mm. and i'm like i'm gonna wherever if i ever leave lsg i'm gonna be asking like do you have a robust project management team and will they kick my ass if i don't respond to the cards uh, that are in click up because she will <laughs> um but yeah like it's it's gotten a lot again it's like you like I feel like every agency that does automation does the same thing where they're like there's one guy who can kind of code and is like I don't know, a guy gender neutral who can kind of code and is like oh I'll make some tools to make my life easier and then the tools make everyone's life a lot easier and then they're like okay we're gonna hire an actual developer and then there's a bunch more tools and it saves everyone a lot more time and it just kind of expands out. And then you go back to the early tools and you're like, oh, we need to redo these because we have standards now. Um, that sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, and but, sometimes you fall into something too. You don't, you start building something thinking you're solving problem A and then you find out it it actually is much better for problem B and that there's monetary value to that, you know, like that's the fun stuff. Like yeah. Jarvis, right? Like Jarvis is proven to be, you're like, whoa, this thing is awesome. How awesome is it? Is yeah. it this awesome or is it like world changing awesome kind of thing? Obviously I think it's world changing awesome, right? Like having yeah. a little like Slack bot that I can, tell to go do things to be useful to me and it does them and like I don't know we have we can just add functionality to it like our 
team is really good at kind of, you know, coming to us with, you know, they're all SEO, so they're like, here are the problems we need solving, and we can just add a module that's like, your problem is solved now. Um, and like, I don't know, it, it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a watch the space kind of thing. And Jarvis yeah. is an exciting guy. Are um, you, are there any specific problems that, that you feel like you just want to solve long-term? Anything really fascinating? Like, like for me, my itch is topic clustering. Like, are there any itches that, that you're okay sharing? Um, I have to do data and SEO versus anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, well, you know, like world hunger, uh, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, that matters. I, I think like I'm really interested in how we can improve con- our, like clients' content and our content on the web. Yeah. And I think part of that is through like using natural language processing as a way of accompanying and improving content rather than kind of, I feel like this isn't a call out for anyone in particular. I'm, I'm not dissing any, anyone. I'm not being mean, but like, I feel like there is a lot of uh, SEO content that comes from look at what the other top 10 things are doing and just do the same thing. And it's just meant Google searches are just the same top the same 10 articles over and over again. And I think NLP can help support building more unique, interesting content and bringing in like topic clusters and like that spoke approach in a way that makes the web better and not worse. Um, Day. Also, I'd, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go, go, Jess. Keep going. Keep the other going. thing I'd love to fix is like accessibility, but that's a whole other can of yeah. worms. So we're just gonna. Whew. I had yeah. a meeting with a friend of mine who is both blind and an accessibility expert, and we had a Zoom yesterday. Yesterday was uh, Bring Your Kids to Work Day in the United States, and I brought my kids. They hung out with me mm-hmm. as I worked all day. And uh, I had a meeting with my friend Raghavendra and like being in the same space as he was trying to navigate Google search console, it's accessible, but like the cognitive load that they're under to interact with anything having to do with digital devices, they like speed up the sound so that they can ingest meaning. And it's like, a machine gun of words. It's just like, and it's super loud. And I was like, I felt, uh, I, I, it made me physically anxious uh, to be, to have to listen to it. And I was like, man, this is really, really hard. And he was like trying to understand how can I get search console data in a way that I can consume it. And I, and my takeaway really was like, I got to get data into Google Sheets for him because that's accessible. Like he can use that easily. Uh, But that's a problem that I'm interested in too, like uh, making data accessible for folks. But that's not where you were at. You were more general, like making the web accessible. But I mean, I think if like that's a really cogent like example, right? There are lots of websites that are accessible but really annoying to anyone who needs to use accessibility yes like i i don't know i'm big on i sometimes i'll get a migraine uh and i'll want to lie down but i still want to consume information um and i'll hit a screen reader and i have certain sites that i just don't use anymore because this like screen reader experience is so garbage Mm. um and I know, I know, like, I, I put together an extension for a friend because she was just like, I don't want to see these sites anymore in my search results because I can't use them. I hate using them. They do not work for me. And so I put an extension that just blocks those, uh, those uh, search results on Google because she can't use them. Why should she, like, Yeah. they wow. just shouldn't be there, like, 
Um, I don't know. So I get heated. I get heated about like <laughs> trying to make the web better instead of worse, um, which I think everyone gets a little heated about. Uh, but I think SEO and like automation and web people are all in a good position to improve things. Um, so I'll keep yelling about it, I guess. So Jess, you just hit a nerve for me. Um, I do a lot of rooms on Clubhouse where we talk about advanced SEO topics. And a lot of times people will jump in because they hear that it's about automation and they go straight to how do I like build PBNs in an automated fashion. And it's just like, I get so angry. It's like, look, I'm not going to promote this idea. This is just making the web worse. I don't want to talk about it. You're off the stage. Boom. <laughs> and, it, and I'm not <laughs> that bad, but it's like, you just totally hit a nerve for me. And I didn't vocalize it. And I don't know, I've had, a, I've struggled with how to turn what that concept that you just brought up of like, look, we can automate things, but we should leverage it for good. And I don't know how to approach that conversation that person brought up with like, uh, yes, I love automation, but that does not mean making the web a worse place. You know, it's just interesting concept you brought up. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, like, I think it's, it's awkward when someone is like in front of you and like brings up a concept and you're like, oh, this sucks. But like, you're a human being right here. And I don't want to be like, you suck, dude, to a person, right? Yeah. Um, but, like, getting, like, confronting that kind of thing can be uncomfortable, but it can also be useful. Because, yep. you know, I get I get the urge to want to put together a PBN or whatever, because I think for some queries they probably still work, but it, they suck a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Um like I think say and it's hard when someone just wants a kind of quick fix quick like I just want to rank something and like get my dividends and get out to be like you will make this google search result a worse place it feels very small and petty to be like Hmm. that right but I think people are very bad at thinking on a grand scale like one of my actions is contributing to making the whole thing a worse place and like putting it in those terms is important that was rambly apologize oh no i uh i mean we've had a lot of really great people on our show you know like hamlet batista was our first big guest and he he i've said this on twitter a whole bunch and i know jordan feels the same way it's like give, 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 you know, that, that was Hamlet in a nutshell. And, and uh, I feel like it's important to lead with an open heart, to share, to give, to pull people up. And when you do that and you, you help people who are new to our craft, like improve their skills, get better, you help them meet the right people that the people who are in front of you, look down and they see that and then they're willing to help you too. So it's just like, make, make the web a better place, make SEO a better place, try and connect people, make it, make it happier. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. So we talked about um, you, you were talking about making the world a better place and humans and being a human being. Uh, Can we get into some things that you really care about? Any specific uh movements or organizations that you want to shed some light on bring awareness to yeah i think currently um there is a lot of anti-trans hatred in the us and uk specifically um i think there are a lot of anti-trans bills going through in a lot of states especially in like texas and i think idaho weirdly had one um and so it, I would really appreciate it if you like talk to your Senate, called your representatives or senators or like, I don't know, the people who are pushing this, like your state reps, people who are pushing these kinds of bills and be like, hey, this sucks. You know, I think, you know, trans people should be allowed to exist uh, 
hundred percent. Like, I don't know, a lot of it is about kids who socially transition. So uh, they uh, were defined as female at birth or male at birth. And then when they're like 15 or like, I don't think I'm that gender anymore. I think I'm this one. Um, a lot of the time they just, they socially transition. So they present as the gender they want to, they are, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of senators have been kind of fear mongering about this being a big problem for people. And I, I haven't found that to be true in my, I've, I've spent a lot of time with the LGBT community uh, as I am an L, I'm one of those people. Um, and I think this is the kind of thing that can lead to some dangerous situations. I'm sorry, I ranted about that a little bit longer, um, but I think it's a, like, no. nope. We're something all... I'd like to get some eyeballs on. Um, yeah. And like, I don't know, the Trevor Project in the US and Mermaids in the UK are both organizations that can really help like young trans and LGBT people. That's awesome. We're really we'll, glad you we'll, shared that. We'll include links in the show notes for sure. Thank you. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I think we're almost out of time. This has been amazing. I can't wait to meet you in real life. I don't yeah. know where we're where it's going to be and when, but I I'm really hoping I'm Tech sure. SEO Boost comes back to Boston because I I think yeah. that would be a good one. That's my favorite yeah, conference. In. I would love to yeah. get in. I guess I gotta we gotta weasel our way in. I think you can do that. I think you can manage. You can go. I'm good at the weasel. <laughs> yeah. Get some classic lobster rolls. Come on, Massachusetts is full of I know, seafood. Yeah. I know. I love Massachusetts. I <laughs> lived on Nantucket Island for 20 years. Hell yeah. One of the coolest places in Massachusetts. Have you been? I've been like twice. Epic. It Epic. rules. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love Nantucket. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well... I think this, it feels like a great time to wind it down, to go dark, to call La Fine. I don't know, is that correct in French? Would that be to say, did I say it right? La, L? La, la, la Fine. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> okay, everybody, thanks for another amazing edition of Agency Automators. Jess, this was magical. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jordan, rock star. Thank you so much, Jess. I'm loving all no your worries. questions, dude. I'm loving how <laughs> you're like jumping in like bam, bam, bam. It's amazing. I'm really stoked on it. Um, everybody, thanks for another amazing edition of Agency Automators. We'll see you again soon. Keep automating, keep working, and uh, catch you on the flip side. Peace. Bye. Bye.